Sid. Hey, Sid. Today, Sid, we have a friend of mine on the podcast. His name is Indra, and he's a mycologist from Denver. Awesome. Are you stuck? No, I'm just sucking ADHD and like. I'm going to take the altar for cannoli because <laughs> there. What, are we, what are the choices? We have uh, tie dye. I like that. That's psychedelic, yeah. We have uh, mushrooms. Oh, that's good as well. And we have a trendy like. Oh, yeah, like a hipster tie dye. Yeah. Um, I think I like number one. I think that's going to have biggest bang for buck on the video. Boom. Nice choice. I'll be there in like a couple minutes. Bye. He's picking a dog outfit soon. Dog outfit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> so this is ADHD. I just need flowering. <laughs> Yeah, everything put together. I love it. We haven't got the dog dressed yet. What? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look, there's Iggy. Okay, we are prepared. Okay. I get glimpse into my daily life where <laughs> I'm scattered chaos, but I figure things out. We get that. A few moments later. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Bitches, Britney's back. <laughs> yeah, that was very chaotic. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> but it's a good like description of my personality. It's a true sample. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on today. We appreciate mm -hmm. having you. I was very excited to um, get you on the podcast because I feel like you can add a lot of value to talking about your psychedelic journey and also you and your practices as a mycologist. Nico does mycology in Denver, Colorado. Let's start off talking about how you got into mycology. I had a rough childhood and mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of time in therapy in my late teens. I tried different like medications and therapy and I really didn't listen to the doctors and follow them like I should have. So obviously it didn't work, but <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I tried mushrooms. A guy at a music festival um, offered me some when I was like 19 or 20. I took them home. I took them by myself. And I had this amazing, like, revelatory experience of, like, being able to relate to other people and, like, understand other people and kind of, like, get more in touch with myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I loved it. And I decided I wanted to learn how to grow them. It's been, like... <laughs> Well, I'm 31 now, so it's been a mm -hmm. while since then. I've grown them intermittently over the years, but I moved to Denver in 2020, and mm -hmm. that's kind of when everything kicked off. But you're very experienced now, more than 10 yeah. years of experience. It's a long time. Yeah. So I have a question regarding growing mushrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, what type of strains you like to grow and which are your favorite, and what is the difference? Like, do you want to enlighten us with some knowledge here? Yeah. So, like, Generally, like, there's an old phrase in the mushroom community, like, there's regular mushrooms and there's, actually, I forget the phrase. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> there's cubes and then there's penis envy. I, was I love wondering. penis envy. Yeah. They are my yeah. favorite. Very strong. <laughs> cubes are cubes and then there's penis envy. There you go. Okay. <laughs> there are a lot of different strains, but obviously there's one strain of Solospi combatantsis that we grow indoors. Um, my personal favorite is uh, albino penis envy. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it grows a lot slower. It takes about twice as long, but the mushrooms are like a lot more potent and mm -hmm. uh, the effects are different to me. Mm -hmm. How are they different? Like, do you, is it like more visual or? So um, some mushrooms tend to have like a stronger come up. Mm -hmm. and uh, like a body sensation when you're coming up that for some people can be uncomfortable, um, like also nausea. Albino penis envy doesn't have that. Um, so 
I know there are different like alkaloids in the mushrooms and that one in specific has always been like more enjoyable for me. It's like a more euphoric, um, more pleasant and less just kind of like distressing, uncomfortable experience mm -hmm. on the come up. And like when you collect the spores for the um, albino strains of mushroom, it's a different uh, collection method, right? Because you can't just make a spore print. I don't make spores. I cheat. Oh, you don't. And I, <laughs> I, I I buy liquid cultures and yeah. I buy agar plates. Uh, so I use other people's genetics and kind of mm. work from there. Yeah, For me, it's been easier to do that. I guess the great thing about being in Denver as well, there you arrive with options for what you can get hold of. You skip a step and you remove the potential for a lot of like contamination. Mm. So it makes it cleaner. Um, and it definitely speeds it up. So you never make spore prints? You never collect spores yourself? Just from mushrooms I find around the yeah, town or okay. when I'm hiking. Yeah, you forage as well. You're in there. I Last summer, like, I was growing cubes inside and I walked outside and, like, saw some mushrooms in the park and I was like, I wonder what kind of mushroom that is. And it started me down this rabbit hole of like, I downloaded an app called iNaturalist that like can like, you take a picture of the mushroom and uh, it can identify it with AI mm -hmm. and tell you what it is based on like other people's photos. That's a year good. later, I have like 120 <laughs> like wow. mushrooms that I found around. It's a lot. Autism. <laughs> no, but mushroom hunting is fun. But I won't trust AI <laughs> completely because sometimes, you know, they look the same and then AI can get confused. Yeah. And then it can confuse it with something poisonous and then you take it and... <laughs> so that's one of the nice things about iNaturalist is if it combines it with like a social network. So mm -hmm. there are other people in the area that can confirm or like mm -hmm. say that they disagree with the um, whatever they found, you know. So... Previously, you mentioned contamination. So what kind of, like, what can contamination do to the mushrooms? It's remained a problem for me. Like, it's something that, I don't know, I think that's what mycology is all about, is, like, understanding, like, the microscopic mm -hmm. things that you can't see and, like, trying to figure out where you went wrong mm -hmm. and adjusting next time. I mean, one of the most popular forms of contamination is trike or trichoderma. Mm. And it's this like green fungus that grows on the surface. Like, it's like basically death when you see that. Mm. Like, yeah. your mushrooms are done, throw it out, <laughs> get it out of the house. Do not let it catch on to anything else. Yeah. <laughs> And that's not dangerous to humans, though. That's only dangerous to other spores, right? It's, like, really common in mm. soil and basically mm. everywhere in Earth. Yeah. Just not for our mushrooms. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's just, like, a little bit better than mycelium at growing on our substrate. Mm. So it has to compete with the mycelium. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot about the process of mycology is, like, uh, about creating sterile environments. So, unfortunately, once you get something like trichoderma, it spreads prevalently if you don't nip, nip it in the bud, right? So, people end up throwing out batches of, of everything and starting from scratch. I've done it. I've wasted hours and hours and hours of my life, like, making the perfect monotubs and, like, labeling them with a label maker. <laughs> and then I sit there and watch the mycelium and I see a little patch and I'm like it looks like mycelium but <laughs> fishy looking I wake up the day and it's like this big <laughs> green <laughs> yeah it's so, it's so disappointing but it's just in the nature of mycology right I don't think I know anyone that doesn't sometimes get things infected part of the learning experience and yeah. it's part of like what maybe like what draws my type of personality to mm. this is like how can i make it better yeah how can i like fix what i went wrong last time yeah yeah yeah, yeah a it's lot of fun. it is, is definitely about like reverse engineering the process mm -hmm. things go wrong. 
Tell us a little bit more about your personal journey with psychedelics and where you're kind of at today because you obviously personally use mushrooms. I know you're into ketamine. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, talk to us about that. I first tried mushrooms when I was like 19 or 20. I told Mm -hmm. you about that. Mm -hmm. I've been a huge fan of psychedelics ever since. Um, They kind of made me lose my interest in alcohol, Mm -hmm. which has been good for me. Just through those experiences and realize like realizing what a jackass I made of myself. What I want <laughs> <to bring. laughs> the journey of the youth. <laughs> yeah. Psychedelic use has changed a lot over the years. Mm. A lot. I moved to Denver and before that I was like relatively sheltered. I had not lived in a big city. I grew up in a small town in Ohio where like drugs were bad and yeah. weed is heroin and if you do it you'll die <laughs> <laughs> so I came from that and eventually worked my way up but like when I moved to Denver everybody was talking about ketamine in my apartment complex ketamine this and ketamine that and I was like what is like isn't that like a horse tranquilizer like <laughs> I'm not into that like weird powders <laughs> But after a couple of years of living here and like interacting with people who do ketamine and seeing how much fun they were having, mm. I was like, okay, you know, maybe I'll give it a try. How would you compare it to doing mushrooms? Like what, what's the difference in the experience for you? Um, so I feel like mushrooms like have a message or like something to teach you. Mm-hmm. And ketamine is like this sort of like medical, sterile, clean slate where you're just cut off the parts of your brain that are thinking all the time. Mm -hmm. Like to me, like ketamine, like reduces your sensory input from the environment. So like normally you're so distracted with like the lights and the sound Mm. and all these things going on around you and when you do ketamine it's like you your awareness flips to this little bubble Mm. around you yeah and if you go deeper and deeper it goes deeper into yourself like it's really fascinating are there any visuals in ketamine uh, ketamine experience or is it just like what you're seeing but it's just more focused in one bubble um i get visuals occasionally i have to do a lot um Mm -hmm. but they're there and they're they're very distinct and different from any other psychedelic um they're not in my experience they're not colorful and Mm -hmm. happy like mushrooms or lsd or dmt it's very like dark <laughs> but not in a scary way. Like ketamine has this like warm, embracing sort of character that just reassures you it's okay. I mean, I don't know if you've ever like had a procedure done or you've been put to sleep for surgery. Mm-hmm. You most likely had ketamine. Have you had DMT before? Yeah. <laughs> what did you? Think? What was your experience? <laughs> um, it's intense. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've had like pretty severe anxiety for most of my life. And I've mm-hmm. always like, I didn't have a lot of friends to like try psychedelics with. So it was sure. always by myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So like when I got DMT, it was always like, I don't know what to go off of. I don't, yeah. I haven't seen friends do it. So I'll yeah, just no try a little bit and go from there. For people that might be listening that don't know about DMT, it's a very short, intense trip. So it's like a 20, 30 minute experience. It's hard to control how hard you trip, right? Yeah. I mean, so with DMT, like your dose is just pretty small. I think like Mm. 30 to 40 milligrams is a really good dose. Um, So you need a small like jewelry scale or Mm. something that can measure in milligrams. a lot of people now are making vaporizers mm. out of DMT where they will combine it with basically the same things that you would, those uh, nicotine vapes, mm. um, like propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. Mm. Um, but you can combine it with that 
and it'll make it into a solution. And um, with the vaporizer, it gives you a lot more control mm. over the experience. You can take a little hit for like a micro dose, or you can take like a really big hit or several if you want to blast off, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Did you experience any like DMT elves? I never went that deep, mm -hmm. personally. Yeah. yeah. I'm not one of the savages that like to <laughs> <laughs> destroy themselves. But when you're in it, though, it can feel a lot longer, right? So if it's like a, a negative trip, it, it doesn't It feels like eternity, I guess, when you're it's there. It's just like this sort of effects on time perception, mm. the time dilation that is associated with psychedelics. Yeah. Like it's yeah. different with each one, but even with ketamine, even with cannabis, I notice like a little bit of, you're not sure how fast time is passing. Sydney took a massive hero dose of mushrooms. Um, how long ago was it <laughs> a few years ago? Uh, okay, so I just ate a bunch of mushrooms. I, in my opinion, they were around 14, but it could be more, a little bit Whoa. less. Yeah. <laughs> and they were not like light strain mushroom. They were have, very potent and I didn't know what they were. And then I was lost in a different universe. It feel like an eternity. And then when I came back for a few months, I thought I'm in a wrong universe. Now I'm stable, but for a <laughs> for a very long period of time, I thought this is not real. I'm in a simulation or in a different universe. But yeah, I think even with mushrooms and DNT, my personal experience, you go to the same type of place. Mm. When you talk about your your really like big trip, though, it said it reminds me a lot of. Um, like how people discuss DMT, like because you actually met certain characters and had well, a yeah. spiritual kind of awakening. It was very different, different because I met definitely entities and then I met God as well. Mm. Not like God as a person sitting on a throne, but like an impersonation of God. The God was speaking, but it wasn't there. And then I become myself a God of my own universe. It was weird. And then again, then I met some other angels. So I call them angels. You can call them elves, whatever. Mm. But yeah, those entities which were talking to me, I know that they are the same things you can experience through DMT. Yeah. So I think these all these things lead you toward the same universe or same plane. Mm. Yeah, it's like a portal, right? It's like you use it as a tool to reach a specific reality. Yeah, like I know, like molecularly, um, psilocybin is not that different from DMT. They're in the same family. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think like the scientific name for psilocybin has tryptamine in it. Like they're all from the same family yeah. and they carry the uh, same spirit, I guess. Yeah. And there were two different things I got from there. One was visual. Visual itself was amazing. And my first thing was to document that experience. So I hope created the whole series of art regarding that. Mm -hmm. And then one was spiritual, which changed my pers perspective about everything. I'm a totally different person yeah. just by one big trip. And it's not like it was my first trip. Before that, I always have like a small trip. They mm -hmm. were affecting, but they were not like life changing. Mm. And once you have a life-changing experience, then you you are a different person. And mm. as I personally try to stay away from mushrooms because I don't know. I think I learned whatever I wanted to learn, and I'm also scared of going back to that universe. Mm. I know I will go one day when I die. This is my belief that that was like that's something which is life after death. And that's what I experienced. But like, while I'm alive, I just want to take experience of normality. Maybe I'll do big trips again in the future. But for a while, I just want to stay in the normal universe. Maybe smoke cannabis and stuff. That's a whole different story. But like mushrooms, yeah, they scare me. You took so much, <laughs> Yeah, that was my fault. That's like somebody drinking like, a bottle of 151. <laughs> you, you know, one thing you told me about that it affected, like you don't drink after the mushroom. Mm. This is what happened to me. 
there was an entity talk to me don't ever drink if you drink uh, you will lose the connection with us and then the connection mm-hmm. stayed with me for two months and i want to get out of it i didn't want to have any connection with that universe or those mm-hmm. entities so then i what start if i told you that that entity is you <laughs> There is a possibility, yeah. <laughs> no, that that hey, it was you all along. <laughs> yeah. You know I'm scared. <laughs> it is shame associated with drinking. Yeah, but I'm not I was never even a heavy drinker. Like I drink mm-hmm. occasionally with a friend or something because I don't like to drink. Mm-hmm. And the thing what I noticed like if I want to end my connection with that entity. I had to drink. So I got drunk for two nights and then after that connection is over. And then I don't drink anymore. But I wanted to end the connection because like it was very crazy for me and I was like I don't want to hear messages from someone else. It's too freaky. So that's why I drink but then I noticed as soon as I drank for two nights I was like quite heavy drinking. I got really drunk. That was gone. <laughs> I think when you describe entities, I think it's really just the psychedelics putting you in touch with like your deeper self and your like subconscious and your intuition and the things that you know, not mm-hmm. like the things that you think about from day to day, but the things that you unconsciously form your beliefs about everything. Wow, that's a that's a good perspective, yeah. 